Right. Um, thank you, Manasuta, for the introduction. Thank you also to Riel for um, having me today. And good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm just very excited to be talking about uh, my research today. And the title of my presentation is Designing the Collaborative Referencing Intervention, uh, the Theoretical Framework, Clinical Outcomes, and Research Considerations. <clears throat> so um, before I begin, um, I'd like to just give you a brief uh, background of um, how my research really um, was started. Um, so my research interests grew from my experiences as a student clinician back in India, um, where I was a student clinician doing my undergraduate program as well as my master's program. And um, that's where I got to see many patients with aphasia. And one of the things that I noticed when I was um, uh, discussing clinical progress with my patients with aphasia is that, um, you know, I used to come up with uh, the test reports and talk about how much progress they've made in therapy with um, the clients, with their families. Um, and mo the most common response that I really got from most of them was that those scores didn't really mean a lot to them because it didn't really impact their everyday life. You know, their life was still the same. Um, since they had had the stroke. So that kind of bothered me. And, you know, I started questioning my, the treatments that I was really providing to all of these clients. And so I decided to start my PhD program with that particular um, question in mind. And um, very soon I realized when I started delving more into the literature of aphasia, I realized that the that my clinical experiences were consistent with what is documented in the literature. And that is that there is a gap between the clinical improvements that we see as clinicians and the functional outcomes that the patients see in their everyday lives. And so this is a, a big cause for concern because um, the everyday communication of, of patients, if that is poor, that may be affecting their participation in um, everyday activities and also affecting their overall quality of life. So my overarching goal of research is really to bridge this clinical functional gap in aphasia and also in other acquired neurogenic communication disorders. <clears throat> So um, when the World Health Organization proposed the ICF framework um, back in 2001, there was a strong push to develop treatments and interventions that looked beyond uh, the body functions or the impairments. So focusing more on activities and participation or the um, environmental factors or other personal factors. And so when that framework was proposed, there were many treatments that were developed that um, could be classified under social approach or a psychosocial approach or even functional approach. Um, and um, direct conversation therapy, conversational coaching, partner training, group therapy are some examples that could potentially fall under these approaches. And these treatments, um, definitely targeted um, goals that were beyond impairments that um, uh, looked at the other components of the ICF. Um, and these treatments also had good empirical evidence in terms of their positive impacts of treatments. Um, for example, people liked these treatments. They reported uh, improved socialization after having received these treatments and uh, families felt supported um, through these treatments. However, um, the theoretical framework um, for learning uh, about the, uh, of these treatments, about uh, what is the therapeutic mechanism or how does learning really occur within this particular um, treatment approach was probably missing um, from many of these treatment methods. So I was then introduced to a novel intervention called the collaborative referencing intervention, which has now become a core area of my research. 
Um, so the collaborative referencing intervention is originally derived from the barrier task or um, referential task experiments that were mainly conducted in psychology. Um, so they studied how speakers make meanings within interactions. And Clark uh, was an experimental psychologist who conducted such experiments uh, mainly on college um, students who were strangers to one another. And so these referential tasks included um, two participants uh, who both sit facing each other with a numbered board in front of them and a full opaque barrier that separates the two uh, participants. And both the participants are given um, 12 abstract Chinese shapes called um, tangrams, as you can see in this particular picture over here. And um, one of the participants is assigned to be a director and the other is assigned to be a matcher. So the director arranges um, these 12 um, Chinese tangrams on their number board and describes their locations to the matcher who has to match those pictures to the same locations. So when all the 12 pictures are placed, it is then considered to be the end of one trial. And then the accuracy of uh, placements of individual pictures is checked so that the boards, the two boards really need to match in the end. And then at the end of the trial, um, the, uh, the trials are repeated again uh, for a total of six times in a session. And these are done in order to assess the changes in referencing patterns of uh, the directors and the matchers across different trials. So on neurotypical adults, Clark found that the pairs who were strangers to each other developed labels or references for these cards. And these references or referential expressions became shorter as the trials were repeated. And the collaborative effort between the two participants also reduced. And that could mean that the time taken for the pair to complete a particular set of card placement reduced across trials. And the number of words or number of turns that the participants took to complete a card placement also reduced across trials. So as you can see in the transcript that I've provided over here, um, it, this, is, this is from the Clark study. The referential expression on trial one that you see, um, the person says, okay, the number seven looks like sort of like an angel flying away or something. It's got two arms. And I'm not sure which picture they're referring to, perhaps the one on that C over here, but that's the referential expression that, they, that um, this individual used in the very first trial. And when the same card was played for the next six trials, the referential expression seems to have um, shortened and the number of words that they have used uh, have also, uh, you know, has, has also kept reducing. And then in the final trial, the sixth trial, the only expression they have is the angel. And uh, that's it. So, um, that was the research uh, paradigm, the referential task as it was used in um, psychology. And so researchers in CSD were interested to study the referential tasks in individuals who have cognitive communication disorders. However, these referential tasks had to be adapted um, to better serve this population. So they reduced the length of the barrier from a full um, opaque barrier to a partial barrier so that the pairs could see each other's faces um, for multimodal communication, but were still not able to see the boards of one another or the pictures of um, each other. Um, and then instead of selecting stranger pairs like they did in psychology, they selected routine communication partners or significant others, or in some cases, clinicians um, to serve as the partners for these tasks in order to increase their motivation to complete the task and to also just have fun with the task. 
And finally, the participants were asked to alternate their roles of being a director and a matcher um, so that the pairs really got um, equal opportunities to develop those references. So these were some of the adaptations that were done uh, to the referential tasks before it was implemented um, in individuals with cognitive communication disorders. Um, so when the adapted referential task was conducted in individuals with aphasia, amnesia, and early stage Alzheimer's disease, um, surprisingly, the results on collaborative referencing was similar to that of the neurotypical adults, um, despite their communication impairments. That is, um, there was robust learning of references, that is the time taken um, reduced across trials. Um, referential expressions became shorter and the collaborative effort was also reduced, meaning the number of words and the number of turns taken also reduced across trials. Now I have an example um, here, there are two videos. Um, these are from um, Mr. Depo is the pseudonym for this uh, particular individual. He's a person with chronic aphasia, chronic Broca's aphasia. Um, he's doing the referential task with Martha, who is the clinician. And this particular data is actually from a treatment session, which I will be presenting later, but I'm only using this to demonstrate successful referencing here today. So let's watch this first one. <laughs> Started the project on the Lauren. And see the Lauren and the two press. Perfect. Now, the little thing at the bottom, it's got the Disney logo. Was that on the trip? Yes. Oh, how nice. Okay, so Lauren in the blue dress on number two. Okay. Um, to uh, Bill and uh, Ron Fire. <laughs> okay, Bill and the Ron Fire on number three. That's right. That's right. Mom and Rachel in the Christmas as Christmas. Mom and Dad, the Christmas as Christmas. present, yeah. What's your mother's name? Uh, let's see. The The win 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 Yes. win 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 so that particular video was from one of the earlier sessions, I believe it was session two. Um, and you, as you can see, Mr. Depot um, has been successful in communicating um, or coming up with expressions about the pictures to Martha, but he's struggling. He uses some multimodality um, to communicate. Uh, this next video is from a later session, I believe session 13. And let's see how he does. The people in the West Wall. West Okay. The one looks. Cameron in the three C glasses. And then the baby glasses. The silliness picture. Mm. So 
there we go. Um, like I said, this was a later session and um, those referential expressions came more easily to him and they seem to be uh, sharing this common ground where Martha definitely knows what um, Mr. Depot is talking about and leads to um, immediate um, and correct card placements. And uh, Mr. Depot is also perhaps using lesser number of words to, um, uh, to Martha about those pictures. <laughs> okay. Um, so apart from uh, successful referencing that we just saw, um, researchers also found that these participants with communication disorders demonstrated more complexities during the task that was not previously accounted for um, in psychology. So that co those complexities included the participants' ability to personalize the labels based on both personal and shared knowledge with the partner rather than um, standard dictionary words. Um, and participants were using uh, varied modalities, um, like you just saw with uh, Mr. Depot's use of um, his phone as an AAC um, device, um, and also various um, resources to communicate with each other. And um, participants demonstrated um, really striking use of diverse discourse practices including sharing personal stories and humor, um, and also just using language really creatively throughout the task. And so I have two more examples that particularly demonstrate the uh, very discourse practices. Um, and this, um, in this video, again, you see another individual with aphasia, his pseudonym is Mr. Bear. Um, he has a mild anomic aphasia, and this is again Mr. Depot with um, severe Broca's aphasia. And this is Martha in both the videos, even though her hair color is different in both. Um, okay. Uh, I know which one it is. Yeah, I know. Here's, here's, here's a group. And we're on the bus to Tijuana. Uh, actually, we were right now, when we took it, we were at um, San Diego. Okay. On getting ready to go to Tijuana. And this is our uh, IASP co uh, convention uh, with a group here. So do you get to see them very often or was it just no, we no, no, we don't. We used to all the time see uh, Gerald, the first one on the right. Mm -hmm. But then Al, we don't see him much now. He's really retired now, and he's more uh, politician uh, oh. right now. Actually, so the girl too, but uh, but uh, Al really is. So. so the picture of the party bus to Tijuana shouldn't get out, or Al's political <laughs> career. <laughs> yeah. Pretty bad. Right. Okay, so the best is the party bus to Tijuana at number ten. Right. Okay. Number eleven. That was Mr. Bear and Martha. Now this is Mr. Default. Uh, yes. Um, The silly mask table. <laughs> That's a great one. The silly mask table. That yeah. looks so good right now. I, I think some milk and some donuts is exactly what we yeah. need. The silly mask table. That's perfect. Okay. So there you see um, lots of stories, lots of humor, despite. Um, the severity of uh, aphasia. And uh, this is something that was, that was not um, really found in the referential task experiments done on neurotypical adults. These people were actually having fun with it. Uh, they were sharing um, stories and they were also like using words that were more creative, more playful, 
And those kind of demonstrated the complexities of the particular task itself and the way the task was designed. Uh, so that was a striking new finding that was documented. Um, so the researchers were inspired from the successful findings that they found, including the robust learning of references that happened in um, people with aphasia, amnesia, and even in um, Alzheimer's disease. Um, people were able to participate in meaningful communication. And uh, that was another uh, important finding as well. And the natural way in which the task created multiple opportunities for meaningful referencing, as opposed to um, repetition, like a drill-based repetition, and also the opportunities uh, that the task um, provided in terms of using diverse discourse practices, in terms of narratives or uh, playful episodes. So all of these findings um, suggested to the researchers that the adapted referential task really had high clinical implications. Therefore, they decided to adapt the collaborative referencing research paradigm as, a, as the collaborative referencing intervention. So the adaptation of the collaborative referencing intervention was grounded in some of the following theoretical principles that I will summarize briefly. Um, this distributed theories of cognition and communication uh, we heard about this in uh, the previous uh, Focus of Asia talk from Julie Hanks a couple of months ago. Um, and this particular theory um, postulates that communication is not really an individual trait or an individual ability, but it is distributed um, across social cultural activities, across um, interpersonal histories of uh, participants, and across communicative resources that we use in our everyday communication. So um, within the collaborative referencing intervention, the focus is not on isolated linguistic behaviors, rather um, it is on the pair's co-creation of references based on their shared um, social historic experiences. Um, and second is the rich communicative environments. Um, this framework is based on neuroscience research that shows animals have positive behaviors and neuroplastic changes after living in complex and enriched environments. So the theory proposes that we design rich communicative environments within our clinical sessions in order to improve the um, cognitive communicative abilities of individuals who have sustained brain injuries by including complex and um, optimized activities with voluntary participation from individuals. So again, within the collaborative referencing intervention, what it means to us is that the tangrams, for example, are replaced by the participants' personally significant pictures so if we are using the referential task as an intervention, um, we, have, we are making it more meaningful by adding uh, personally significant pictures of participants, um, such as of their wedding or um, a vacation um, that, that's important to them. Um, also clinicians are asked to let go of their power and control over the sessions or over the task itself, and really um, has having the clinicians to become a communication partner that can be flexible, that can be um, uh, supportive, and that can shift roles um, as and when needed, um, depending on the needs of the clients. And finally, um, the situated learning theory. So according to this theory, learning is situated in activities, in um, contexts, in different cultures, and um, it is continuous. So what it means to us in the CRI is that it offers, uh, that it, the, the intervention should offer repeated opportunities for the pairs to use references meaningfully 
based on the context and thus support learning. And so that was the framework that was used um, while adapting the referential task um, as an intervention. <clears throat> So with the completion of the adaptation of CRI and having realized the potential of this treatment, I decided to use um, Roby's five-phase model for clinical outcome research to launch a series of studies on CRI and aphasia. So my first study was a phase one case study of CRI and one of the goals of phase one studies is to detect the therapeutic effects using case studies. And um, as for CRI, we had evidence that individuals with aphasia show successful collaborative referencing and they show language learning uh, within the task. And they also show use of diverse um, discourse practices within the treatment. But what we did not know was whether CRI has any impact on everyday communicative activities or on the psychosocial well being of our clients with aphasia. <clears throat> so, in my phase one case study of CRI, I had one participant, Mr. Lee, who had chronic conduction aphasia. And Mr. Lee completed 15 CRI sessions. So this was the um, actual um, int intervention sessions. And each of these intervention sessions consisted of six trials um, of referencing. And Mr. Lee was paired with a clinician for the first 10 sessions. And he was paired with his spouse, uh, Mrs. Lee, who you see in the picture uh, for the last five sessions. Um, so this is Mr. and Mrs. Lee. So um, in this study, along with um, studying the referencing patterns of Mr. Lee, um, I regularly assessed um, the um, Mr. Lee's um, communicative activities using a patient report measure. And for that, I adapted the CAPA, the conversation analysis profile for people with aphasia. Um, to document the conversation style and profile and how it changes across the study. And um, I also regularly assessed Mr. Lee's confidence as part of his psychosocial well being using the communication confidence rating scale for aphasia. So um, here is an example of the adapted CAPA. Um, so it consisted of yes or no questions um, about styles of conversation, about people that uh, he spoke to, about the situations, the communicative situations that he was in, and the kind of topics that he um, spoke about. And so his yes or no responses were recorded and um, the scores um, or his responses based on whether they were positive or negative uh, we plotted them on a graph. And so here's uh, the conversation profile, uh, the adapted CAPA scores, and this shows that um, we recorded them uh, before the start of the treatment and also at the end of the treatment, and also during treatment, uh, we recorded them every week or after every third treatment session. And so uh, the, his reports indicated that there were positive changes happening in his communicative activities, um, which was a very uh, successful finding for us. And then we also um, looked at the communication confidence rating scale, and this was also measured repeatedly. And as you can see, his reports indicate that um, his confidence seemed to be increasing across the study and even in follow-up. So um, for this uh, exploratory study that we had as a phase one, uh, we found successful referencing. We did find um, an impact of CRI on Mr. Lee's communicative activities as he reported on the patient report scale and the same for um, increased communication confidence as well. 
So our next step was to um, plan a phase two study. And uh, phase two studies typically are designed to make preparations for a clinical trial by exploring the early indications of the um, efficacy of uh, presence of efficacy and magnitude of efficacy. So it can be considered a pre-efficacy study. So um, we needed a measure to assess the treatment efficacy of CRI. Uh, so we decided to study if the within task referential learning that we have seen over and over again in multiple patients with aphasia. Um, so we wanted to study if the within task referential learning can be generalized to a standard clinical naming task. So I designed the phase two research as a mixed methods um, design with a multiple probe single case experimental design and an interpretive case study design. So the purpose of introducing um, multiple probe single case experimental design was to uh, implement an experimental control, which was missing in the phase one research. Um, so with the multiple probe uh, design, which is similar to a multiple baseline design, um, except that the um, onset of treatment is staggered for um, different participants and the baseline does not have to be uh, multiple for all for the uh, consecutive participants uh, in order to avoid learning effects during uh, the baseline phase. Um, so I recruited four participants with aphasia, as you can see um, in the picture here. We have Miss C and Mr. Bear, um, who uh, both of them had mild anomic aphasia. Uh, they are all in their chronic stages and Mr. David and Mr. Depo uh, both have about moderate to severe Broca's aphasia and also in their chronic stage. And they were all paired with a clinician partner. And so all four participants attended um, 27 sessions that included two pre-treatment sessions, five baseline, 15 treatment sessions, which was the CRI and five maintenance sessions. Um, as for materials involved, um, I basically used personally significant uh, pictures from all the participants. So there were 30 referencing um, targets or um, 30 topics. And um, I asked each participant to provide at least four photos that belonged to each topic, making a total of 120 pictures per participant. And out of those 120, we used 60 as probe cards and 60 as treatment cards. So they were essentially um, referring to the same target, but they had different views or different perspectives of the target picture. Um, and the probe cards were used for the naming task, which was our dependent variable. And the treatment cards were used during the treatment itself. Apart from the photographs, I also used other materials like the barrier and the numbered playing boards that was required. So for the dependent variable, we carefully designed a naming task called um, collaborative confrontation naming task. Um, in this task, the researcher produced um, 12 probe cards, one after the other, and asked the person with aphasia to come up with a name for each card. And the clinician was instructed to give opportunity uh, for the target participant to label the card first and to suggest a label only if he fails to do so or if asked for help. And examples included um, our wedding or my grandson at the beach. All of those are considered um, as appropriate um, CCN labels. And so these CCN tasks were conducted during each baseline treatment probe and maintenance sessions. So there were five in each of these phases. Um, so all the CCN responses were video recorded for analysis and um, we adapted the, we adapted the PICAS 
multi-dimensional scoring system to score these CCN responses. And the scores ranged from one being no response and all the way to 15 uh, for a complete, accurate, responsive, and immediate response to the probe card. And so two independent um, raters scored uh, each uh, CCN task for all the participants uh, with aphasia. Um, and as for the independent variable, uh, this is the collaborative referencing intervention. We had 15. Uh, we provided them two to three uh, days in the week, and each session was about 60 to 90 minutes long. And um, there were 12 treatment cards in each session, and the roles of the director and matcher was alternated uh, for each trial. And there was a partial barrier in between. Um, and the naming probes or the CCN tasks were conducted after every third CRI session during the treatment phase. So the CCN scores were plotted on a graph. And as you can see, um, we did a visual analysis and a statistical analysis. And on visual analysis, we found the uh, the treatment um, scores in, in improved for each participant as soon as the treatment was introduced. We see that for Ms. C, we see that difference for Mr. Bear, for Mr. David, and for Mr. Uh, Depot. Uh, we found that the treatment mean um, for all four participants was um, significantly different from the baseline mean uh, for all participants. And there was a baseline trend uh, only in Ms. C. We would like the baseline to be flat, uh, but Ms. C's did show a trend, uh, but we did use a baseline trend correction for Ms. C. And there was also um, immediacy of effect um, in all participants, and there was no overlap of data across the phases for any of the participants. And on statistical analysis, we found that the overall treatment effect size um, of the tau u was found to be 0.92, indicating a significant change in treatment from baseline, suggesting that the treatment may be efficacious for these participants. Um, further, uh, we did a fidelity assessment uh, we included a procedural fidelity to assess um, the implementation of the CCN probes, as well as the treatment fidelity to assess the implementation of the treatment itself. And we did that using two rating scales um, that were um, scored by two trained raters uh, who scored all the uh, CCN uh, tasks in the probes and who scored all of the treatment, well, some of the ran random, um, 12 random CRI sessions for treatment fidelity. And uh, we got 100% mean fidelity score for both. Um, and we also conducted a social validity assessment by conducting interviews uh, with participants with aphasia, um, caregivers, as well as the clinician uh, partners. And, um, we also did a thematic analysis of their responses. Uh, and some of the things that were a highlight from these interviews were that um, under social significance of goals, uh, one of the participants said, uh, well, one of the caregivers, Mrs. Bear, said he was very motivated because he got to talk about his kids and his job as a school principal. Um, importance of the effects, Mrs. Depot says um, he spoke about complex issues like global warming with his grandson. Practicality of the procedure, um, Mrs. Depot says we have started playing this game at home. He pulls up a picture on his phone and describes it and I have to guess it. And the clinician partner also says very practical and it is cost effective. It's not just real life goals. Activities are also like real life. So overall, we got um, highly positive comments um, under the social validity assessment, which was fantastic. Um, so these successful findings are now actually published in AJSLP. Um, so for more details, you can definitely refer to the article. Um, so 
um, with that successful um, research of my phase two study, um, I conducted another phase two study of CRI, which was a replication and an extension of the 2021 um, study. And the purpose of this particular study was to strengthen the CRI evidence uh, with replication and to um, improve the external validity and also to develop um, more meaningful outcome measures, mainly with respect to conversations. So um, I recruited three new participants with aphasia who all completed 15 um, CRI sessions, uh, which was the independent variable. And they completed the collaborative confrontation naming task as the dependent variable. And in addition, uh, we added a conversation probe um, as another dependent variable to assess the impact of CRI on conversations. Um, and the analysis for this study is currently still ongoing and um, I'm really looking forward to what I find. So additionally, I have also submitted a research proposal to the ASH Foundation to conduct another phase two study of CRI, again, as a way to prepare for a clinical trial um, by identifying appropriate outcome measures for both assessing conversations as well as quality of life in aphasia. And um, still waiting to hear back about this proposal. Um, so advancing my line of research on collaborative referencing, um, the intervention was traditionally designed as a one-on-one -on -one intervention. So I'm currently exploring the feasibility and benefits of a multi-party CRI or a group CRI. Um, and considering the design of the CRI, it lends itself very easily to a group setting, uh, providing more opportunities to reference and to share stories. And thus um, I anticipate um, successful learning as well within a group setting. Uh, so this particular project is funded and um, I'm hoping to start the data collection soon this semester. Um, so next steps for this line of research is for me to conduct a multi-center phase three clinical trial to um, investigate the treatment efficacy of CRI uh, for aphasia. Um, I'm planning a submission for funding um, soon. Um, I'm also looking for potential data collection sites and collaborations. Um, so please get in touch with me if you're interested. And if all goes well um, in the near future, I will also be beginning to think about uh, phase four research. So knowledge translation, um, implementation, so having completed the efficacy study and would be looking at the effectiveness um, and considering the steps for implementation within clinical settings and community settings. And these are my references. Any questions? So stop sharing. That was great, such an excellent line of work. Um, okay, let's wait for questions. Does anybody have specific questions? Okay. Um, can, can I? Uh, hi, hi, Suma. Um, I, I think this is a really impressive line of research you've got going here and uh, your study design to me seems really, really defensible uh, as single case studies go. So I think you're on really solid ground here. Um, something I've heard from uh, folks about collaborative re referencing um, uh, kinds of approaches uh, is that like on a superficial level, it seems in some ways quite similar to things like constraint-induced language therapy. I don't know if you've, if you know, you've ever thought about this or you've you've heard about it. Um, if you just look at like in a, you know, just look at the kind of the surface behaviors, you have people interacting um, and they don't use a barrier in CILT, but you know, the participants have cards. But 
you know, there's something about that that doesn't quite sit right with me. And as somebody who knows more about uh, CRT, maybe you can, uh, you know, you have, a, you have a perspective and you can articulate it. How is this different uh, from something like uh, CLIT, which superficially they look quite similar? Yeah, I think um, I'm glad you said superficially they do look um, similar in terms of the task itself, perhaps. Uh, but I think I always go back to the, you know, the theoretical framework that was used to adapt this um, psychological experiment, really, as an intervention. And the motivation that, or the, uh, the principles and the, uh, the support from the theories really is different, I guess, from, um, the, from the theories that is backing up the uh, CILT. Um, and I think that's one of the big things that I always go back to um, is the situated theories that we use, the rich communicative environments. We are not imposing any constraints within this um, intervention, um, apart from the barrier, which is a part of the game um, and is not really a constraint as such. We are actually encouraging participants to use multimodality as opposed to um, verbal only. We are uh, giving more credit to uh, successful communication as opposed to verbal only communication. So I think um, there are a lot of ways in, uh, in terms of the uh, thought put, to, put behind designing the intervention, I think is uh, theoretically different. Yeah, and I think what might land up happening is there are elements of uh, CRI that kind of appear uh, in um, you know, constraint-induced uh, aphasia therapy, sort of inadvertently, right? They, you, you know, folks who are doing that are setting up a situation, um, but it, it seems as though you're more aware of the theory and uh, the underpinnings. Um, so I just wanted to get your perspective on that. Um, Could I jump in here? I can't help but jump in on that one. That was a great question, Brent, and I loved your answer, Suma. I just, another way, using the words you used, another way to think about it is the goal of the CRI is to engage with the patient in successful gameplay. That's it. Um, it is not targeting linguistic forms or patterns of production. It is targeting, um, referencing targets. In other words, whatever it is the patient wants to think, talk, be able to talk about. And it, and it recognizes this collaboration over time that, that Suma talked about, it recognizes that when we reference things, we often say them differently at different times for different reasons. Um, so we're not looking for the repetition of a particular form. Um, and so I think those, and I think Suma is absolutely right. If you don't hold on to what the theoretical aim or goal here is, what it supports, we are so well trained to do more formal tasks that we will slip back into that because we, we have to be able to do that for formal assessments, but this is not a formal assessment. So I, I really like that question. And as, a, as an outsider and somebody who's never done CRI or CIAT, uh, it, it just seems as though there's more respect for human creativity in CRI. And so we don't have these kind of um, predetermined goals of where we're going. The goal is to be able to communicate, right? And any, you know, and so whatever you can use in the moment. And so you have respect for a small community, two people uh, over time developing this, this reference system. And there are no more um, pa parameters placed on it than that. And so, um, you know, lots of people have talked about how people with aphasia are actually really good and really creative at finding ways of being communicative despite the fact that they face these obstacles. And so sometimes maybe the best thing we can do as clinicians is just to step out of the way and let them do their thing, right? Or set up an environment where it's possible yes. for yeah. them to understand this. And so, yeah. Absolutely, hence the rich environment. We're not, we're setting up the environment and being the kind of partner that optimizes their ability to use their creativity to get better. <laughs> we can't fix them, they have to fix themselves. So very nice. Great, thank you so much. Uh, I'm just gonna track the chat. So Julie Griffith had the same question um, and she asks, how will group CRI be different, similar to um, you know, CIAT? 
And so I'm going to move on to the next one. Um, Satya Pal asks, says, wonderful presentation. I would like to know how early we can start this intervention as most of our, most of your participants were chronic. Yeah, that's a good question. And um, I think that's one of my other uh, aims is to start thinking about um, acute status of aphasia and to see um, what uh, type of effects we might find. Um, and really thinking about, um, theoretically, if you're thinking about the intervention, um, I think the findings should be similar um, to what we have seen in chronic patients. Um, so, but we, we don't know that yet. We haven't done the research yet on acute stages. Uh, we have um, one or two clinicians who have implemented uh, the intervention um, in acute stages, and we've um, they've told us that uh, it was successful, uh, but I think the next step is definitely to um, extend this to acute populations and see what the results will be. Perfect, thank you. Um, and then Dr. Leora Cherney um, asks, and this is actually related to a question I had, um, could CRI and its goals be achieved without using a barrier? And I'm just gonna piggyback my question off of that. You mentioned about the idea of multi-party CRI. And so in that kind of a situation, what do you think about removing the barrier and how do you think that would work? Yeah, um, I think uh, in one of the social validity interviews that I uh, presented, one of the participants um, or their spouses talked about how they implemented this CRI at home as just as a game and, and it was fun. And there have been several such reports where people uh, have tend to uh, do similar activities while they are driving. They try to uh, describe something that they see and the spouse has to you know, guess what the person was saying. So I think there are several ways in which um, you can really uh, recreate the same task uh, without a physical barrier. Um, and another way to think about this is how do we do this electronically or in telehealth? Um, and uh, Jennifer, I know, has been trying to do that um, at her university with her um, um, students and cl clients as well. Um, so I think um, the, the physical barrier, the presence of the physical barrier, um, I don't know if that um, has as much um, importance as it has to do with um, people trying to uh, create this um, common ground with each other and trying to describe uh, what they want to say and try to come to a common ground. And I think referencing is something that we do every day in conversations when we are like right now when I'm trying to tell something to you uh, and you don't know what I'm saying. So there is a sort of a barrier, an invisible barrier. Um, so I think referencing is something that we do every day. So um, regardless of the presence of the physical barrier. Thank you for that answer. Um, okay, Bree says, is CRI something that could be done acutely given methodology? So it um, is related to Satya Pal's question. Jennifer um, writes, I have <laughs> been using CRI and the barrier prevents participants from defaulting to following gaze as the primary communicative modality. Uh, we all orient to the principle of at least effort. This allows CRI to generalize to authentic conversation um, when you're not looking at a shared referent, which I agree. <laughs> um, and then Julie Griffith adds, please forgive me um, if I missed this information, what conversational and quality of life measures have you decided to focus on your next phases and why? <laughs> that's a good question. And that's that has been the hardest um, challenge for me has been to identify outcome measures, especially for um, conversations, to be able to detect changes in conversations, considering how complex and how, how many variables that can be when you are trying to analyze conversational samples of these individuals. And I didn't even have a have a same top, I didn't have a set topic for my conversational probes. So they were just varied. They talked about several different things and it was so hard to uh, find something to hang on to across samples. So at this point, we are looking at um, CIUs for um, conversations. 
Uh, so not the traditional CIUs, but um, I believe uh, Marion Marion Lehman has worked on a CIU conversation um, and a new measure. So I'm trying to um, look at that to see if there can be any changes. Um, we are also trying to look at some of the other uh, discourse, uh, like a novel discourse analysis measure. For example, there's conversational moves um, that uh, Brent has been working with and um, Gloria Olness has been uh, working on. And um, that is mainly looking at speech functions of turns that people take and um, trying to um, categorize different moves as an opening move or a, a continuing move or a repair move and to see how that could potentially indicate people's participation in conversation or changes in participation in conversations. Um, so we are exploring a couple of different um, measures uh, and uh, hoping one of them, or at least the fact that we are using these multiple uh, measures might actually give us a better sense of what's changing um, in the conversations. And as for quality of life, uh, we are using a couple of um, uh, rating scales. The ASHA, ASHA QCL, the SAQOL uh, are a couple of ones that we've selected so far. Perfect. Thank you. We have two more minutes. I want to take the last question. Our Polins, I'm sorry, um, I don't have the first name, but uh, she asks, what instruction do you give the partner, example, the family members, how much does the conversational role of the partner impact the participants' responses and outcomes? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. I really like it because as a new clinician, when I was starting to learn to do this intervention, um, I had a hard time understanding my own role as a clinician. And so, um, again, going back to the theories here, um, the role of the communication partner in this intervention, be it a clinician or anybody else, um, is really to be a communication partner and nothing else. So you really need to take off your clinician hat and not be providing cues or not be uh, jumping in and filling in the word or doing the, tr the traditional clinician things that you would do um, in order to add complexity to the task and be supportive and be flexible. Um, and so I think that is one of the, uh, the, the biggest uh, education or training that I would give to the clinicians who are being the partners. Thank you so much. Another part of that question. Um, it's Jennifer and Dr. Cherney thanking you for a great presentation. <laughs> oh, thank you. All right. Well, we have no further questions. So thanks again, Dr. Devanga, and for everybody uh, joining in. This video will be uploaded shortly. So thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you for having me.